Our guest today is Trevor Blondiel, the founder of Operations Kickstart. Trevor spent more than 25 years leading manufacturing plants only to find out years later he was actually in the people industry. Trevor's passion lives in how we show up and the power of seeing ourselves through the eyes of others. As an alumnus of the Center of Executive Coaching and a seasoned certified emotional intelligence practitioner with Genos International, Trevor has published articles and a soon to be released white paper on his research in emotional intelligence and the impact EI can have on an organization's results. Today, Trevor is going to speak with us about coaching with a specialty in emotional intelligence. Trevor, it's so good to be with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we've, we've been in touch now for a few years. I've been following your business and uh, I really like the work that you're doing. Obviously, we have some parallels in the work that we do and the, the feelings that we have around emotional intelligence. So it's going to be a real joy asking you about uh, your work. Awesome. So I'm just going to jump right into it, Trevor, and ask you the first question, if that's all right. All right. So your previous line of work, as I mentioned in the introduction, is in leading manufacturing plants. And you said that you found out years later you were actually in the people industry. Tell us more about what you mean by that. You get excited. You're in your career and you find your spot. And I've always liked operations. And there's just that tangible aspect of making stuff and the technology that goes with it, you know, whether it's a greenfield plant that you launch from just a piece of property to a great organization making a different type of product. And you get really excited about all that growth and career growth. And the whole aspect of relationships are always there. I mean, I'm a people person. I, I like that. But it took me many, many years to realize that isn't really my role. And maybe it's that transition of your different responsibilities in the organization. And, you know, the more people that you have with you, you know, the, the greater the responsibility to look after people mm -hmm. and not yourself, mm -hmm. but it's much easier to just get focused on yourself and your own career and, and realizing it's like, man, I wish I would have had somebody pull me by the ear earlier, or maybe they did. And I just wasn't ready to listen. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you, you really start to realize that, you know, your success is measured by the people around you. And when you started seeing people get promoted that you work with and, and really what kind of an impact can you have by making that connection? You, you got to show up, you got to engage with people, you got to connect with them. And then that's when all the magic happens. And it just seemed like it was later on. It was like, oh, like I need to slow down a little bit. I need to listen a lot more. I need to talk a lot less. And, and a lot less about what I know and a lot more of showing how much I care. Wow. This is some super sage advice there. I hope people picked up on that right there. Talk <laughs> a lot less, listen a lot more, show how much you care. Yeah. I love that. Uh, now, like me, you're a huge proponent of emotional intelligence. Where, where do you find that leaders miss the boat on uh, understanding or applying emotional intelligence? It really comes down to Am I just trying to get down to the next task, uh, project management? We look at deadlines and goals and we get really focused on what's right in front of us. And this whole concept of, I had this bad saying of, you know, just leave your emotions at the door mm. <laughs> and uh, that did not serve me. So I, I had some success in spite of some of the gems that I, I really lost out on because I had this whole mentality of like, you know, you just got to leave your problems at home and yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, but there's so much information in emotions and by making that connection, I mean, we can save a lot of productivity and time by making that time up front. So you invest into that. I think that's really that whole thought of, well, you know, when we got time, you know, we'll look at some, maybe some leadership training, emotional intelligence. It sounds interesting. You know, when I get some people interested and, you know, we'll put that in the budget for next year. And it's just, you need it when the pressure is on, you know, you need to build that resilience, build that self-awareness. It's not, it's not a one day training course. It's a lifelong journey. It's like, I, I'm learning stuff in every conversation. 
So a couple of things that I'm hearing there. Uh, one, one is there, there is this idea that emotions in the workplace are not necessary. And, uh, and this might be uh, even more prevalent in the manufacturing industry in, in, in uh, uh, running operations. It's a, it's a logical, systematic uh, way of, of being. And so you might think that emotions are less important, uh, but there's a lot of information there, as you said. And, uh, and then this other idea that, well, then uh, let's just get training on. We'll just dedicate a day to it. And then, and then we'll be all set. Yeah. So there, there, there may be this, uh, this uh, misunderstanding that you can train emotional intelligence in a day and, and, and transform your workforce. But as we know, it takes a little more than that. Uh, but it's a great start. How, how have you been successful in speaking with decision makers to buy into the idea of investing into their people, right, with coaching and training? Uh, what makes up their mind considering they're busy, they're under stress, you know, they'd rather put it off. Like, how have you been able to convince people to do it now? Well, I've learned how I shouldn't be trying to convince people. And I get a lot of referrals and it's like, oh, Trevor, you really need to help out this place. They, you know, they're, they're in a lot of trouble and you know, it's, it's a difficult culture. They're having a lot of turnover. And I've learned that those are the decision makers I don't really want to spend a lot of time with. Cause they're for, so far on the other side mm. that they're, they're just not, they're just not ready. Uh, kind of maybe like I was 15 years ago when I got some really good mindfulness training and I, and I didn't start practicing a daily meditation until about four years ago, mm -hmm. even though it was introduced to me, I'm really finding that, that either two options, one, you've done some type of investment into leadership development, something like there's already some type of culture there. You're going from good to great. You want to take the next level. And then the other side where I've seen it successful is when you're dealing with the person at the top, either the owner, CEO, general manager. And if you're in that space and you can make that build some trust and relationship with that decision maker, I've never had it where I've just had you know, the first conversation uh, and all of a sudden, yeah, we're, we're, we're ready to sign a contract. It's really more just, hey, is this a good fit? Is this a good fit between my own personality and the culture of that organization or who they want to become? But if you can start working with that person, and I've had that experience where then the people reporting up to this person or the people at that plant or at that company, then they're like, oh, I see some changes. So you've got two, you got the double effect. You've got the effect of one, you've just worked with that CEO and now you've got some buy-in and trust because you have that relationship. Two, you've got the whole organization's buy-in because they're like, oh man, if you can get Sarah to change a little bit like that or Johnny, then I want to hear more about what this emotional intelligence and this whole self-awareness and how we show up business is all about. Mm, yeah, I, I like that. You know, in the in the world of of sales, uh, we believe that it's always easier to sell to someone that you've already sold to, or who's a buyer. Uh, and 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 then the second idea of of working with one person first and and creating some change, and then letting that ripple out and create an, an influential positive effect that then makes it easier for you to say, well, gee, imagine what we could do if we were able to work with the whole group, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Those are two yeah. really good, good ideas, Trevor. Really appreciate your wisdom on that. Yeah. Cause the, the worst thing is you go in there with a new client and it doesn't last, right? Then that's, that I've been really mindful of, of partnering with people that are like-minded and they, and they do want to get better and they're, are they willing to do the work? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's, that, that's really the, so much of a small part is the coaching is the training it's all the practice and then coming back and then unpacking that and trying something different and it's like hey you know i just i didn't talk during this meeting and it went really well and i just asked some questions at the end and oh okay well let's that's good now now you're getting buy-in because you tried it and it's you believe mm -hmm. it because it worked for you right and, and and now let's build on that but what if there's somebody watching this video, a leader who would like to try a couple of things just, just on their own, they want to experiment. What ideas do you have for a leader who would like to just try a few things to become a little more emotionally intelligent in the way they show up and lead? I always say, I love the power of seeing yourself through someone else's eyes. 
So like, you know, do you have someone that you trust that, that you feel psychologically safe with, right? That the, the person that's not going to try to maybe take you, a lot of the times it's, we have a weakness and we don't really want to show that. But if you have somebody just having that conversation of, Hey, you know, it's just watching some of Michael's material. And one of the things was, you know, how am I showing up? Like, how do people perceive me? For, you know, because you may have some indication, like I know I was a person that I got some survey feedback one time and was like, Trevor should realize that you can't build Rome in a day. And I'm like, am I really like that? And yeah, you kind of are. And it's kind of like, you, get, you know, you're good at getting stuff done, but sometimes it's the expense of others, right? Mm -hmm. To get that task done. And it's like, oh, well, that's not who I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't see it. So, you know, you can't fix what you're not willing to expose. So just having that courage to ask somebody and just get some feedback of, Hey, how am I doing? You know, at the end of the meeting, how did that land? It's a good challenge. It's a good challenge, right? So at, ask for feedback and, and reflect upon that feedback. Uh, what else? What, what's, what's one other thing that you think a leader can do? Well, in, in those meetings or in those conversations, just trying to be that last person to speak. I, mm. I play the Simon Sinek two minute, two minute video often. And there's some magic in that. And just, you know, if I just didn't talk and I already have my ideas, but I just kind of waited to kind of see other people's ideas, especially if you're the leader, if you're, if you're the person, yeah, the most senior person in the room and, and have that. And the other, the third one I kind of put in there is taking that extra 20 seconds in, in a conversation. And the example that jumps out in my mind was just last week, working with a, a manager in a manufacturing plant and had a bunch of senior engineers working with them. And there was a breakdown and there's a group chat going on in one of the engineers. And he's trying to, he's working on, and I'm working with him to be a more emotional, intelligent leader. Mm -hmm. And through this text chain and there's pressure, the line's down. So, I mean, this is off time and people are at home and they're texting. Some people are coming to the plant and they're throwing out ideas. And so one of the engineers throws out an idea. Well, what he did was he didn't dismiss the idea there because he, he knew he had some background on it, but he, he texted in a side text to this engineer and saying, hey, you know, appreciate this thought. This is just some history behind it. And it's good for you to know this because I know you're newer here and just want to share that information and, and kind of left at that. He sent a second text right after and just said, Hey, the reason I sent that text to you directly is because I really respect your ideas. I didn't want it to come across as condescending or something in the group text. And, and basically just kind of told, told the person how he felt and, and that what the intention was the next mm. day that engineer came to him. He said, you know, when I read your first text, I thought, well, fine, I just won't give my ideas. And I got your second one. And it meant so much to me that to understand that you were doing that you know, to, to help me. And sometimes we just forget that part. We assume that, oh, that person's going to pick up on it by just saying, Hey, this is how I feel about you. This is why. So just that, that whole connection of mm. what about the emotional part of it? I, I did it because I care about you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought that was and, awesome. Yeah. yeah and, and, it just, and as you said, it, it just takes a few extra seconds. It's that little bit more that can make that difference. So there's been, there's been three good ideas shared here that a leader can apply right away without training, without investing in a long-term coaching program. There's 10 times more than that, that mm -hmm. a leader can start to incorporate and really transform their leadership. But that's a great start, these ideas that we've talked about here. So my next question was actually going to be asking you about an example that you wanted to share of, of how you've helped uh, in organization, but I, I think you you answered that question with that example. You just went went right into that example of something that was going on. So, so I'd like to ask my next question instead, which is, how do you present coaching and what it can do to help someone who's never had coaching before? Yeah, so I, maybe I can answer your, your previous and this one together. Okay. Working with a new client, in some of these private ownership companies, especially, I mean, there's some amazing companies out there that whether it's a second generation or it's a family business that that's really grown or just a successful business that really hasn't dealt with anyone from the outside. And so there's an owner that approached me and I was, it was referenced through somebody else. It was very skeptical, very skeptical. And, and that's okay. And it was totally 
cool because he just didn't know what to expect. Mm. So I definitely did not go into the coaching conversation at all. Uh, actually, it was much longer after I even got a contract and started working with this company. And there's always that balance of, you know, that coaching versus consulting and really working with this company. As we went along further, we went a little bit more into what, what is this coaching <clears throat> and realizing that, Hey, sometimes I, I can tell you that audits, for example, I can tell you that audits are really important and, you know, we should really do them because if it's a law of entropy and gravity and things will get pulled down if, if we don't keep having some type of an audit to make sure if our place is going to be organized and how we want to organize it. So you got to audit that all the time. And then I would talk to him and he'd be frustrated because the place wouldn't be organized. So he's going to, I'm going to talk to all the people, I'm going to bring them back in again. I'm like, okay, so how's that working for you? And more of that coaching conversation. And then just by having that coaching conversation, someone who's been working on their own self-awareness and trying to pr progress that as the owner, realizing kind of on his own, hey, I need to go back to the audits. And that really, by using that coaching approach, that really helped this owner see it on his own. Because if I said it, it's not going to stick. Mm -hmm. but by just having those coaching conversations and knowing that, hey, there's a reason why we talk that way, being upfront and intentional, of, this is why I'm kind of asking the questions and you know, just see what you think. And if you think it's good, it's probably going to work. So it, it's presenting coaching uh, and uh, practicing it, actually coaching, coaching the client. You find that that's a, an effective means of helping someone to understand who hasn't had coaching before, how it can help. That, that was the approach in that situation. And I'll give you a, a second situation where just got a, a coaching, formal coaching contract. Mm -hmm. And with that one, I took some articles, wrote it in my own words of what to expect from coaching and I'm trying to, to create some material that way. So I think just kind of like doing that soft introduction of, hey, so I've never had coaching before. I'll say, so what to expect here? So I think just always having that upfront easy to digest education. Maybe it's a, it's a video you make, maybe it's a, a one pager that you have, but what's, what's authentic to you so that when you go into that relationship, we have clear expectations and boundaries and that we, we know what to expect from each other. I'm not going to come in here and just tell you what you should be doing different. <laughs> right. I've probably got a lot of people in your life that can tell you that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Good, good idea there. Uh, to uh, educate them because I, I find that I do spend some time doing that when I meet with people who haven't had coaching before. So maybe presenting them with some material that they can study and, and think about even before the conversation to start to understand what coaching is. Uh, so I, I want to ask a question that, that uh, just kind of comes to mind based on what we've been talking about. Recently, my experience, Trevor, in, in uh, establishing a coaching uh, opportunity with a very large company, it's taken me about 10 months and I've had to invest in additional insurance policy uh, per their vendor specifications. So I've had to exercise a lot of patience. There uh, were a couple of times where I almost just kind of threw it in and just forget it. I'll just go go seek another company. Yeah. Uh, what, what has been your experience with needing to have patience and perseverance in uh, establishing working agreements with some larger companies? Patience, yeah. A lot of patience and just yeah. knowing that this is not something you get into and just kind of dabble in it for six months. It, it's a long road where sometimes it's a couple of years later. Mm. And, and for me, and that's why I'm going to be launching a newsletter because a lot of the people that I serve don't have time to go on social media and it's just trying to find, Hey, top of mind. And, and Hey, when, when you are ready and maybe it's been 10 months and you're still thinking about it, I, I really find that, kind of go back to emotional intelligence and I'm practicing self-awareness all the time because it's like, mm. okay, have I not done the right approach with this client? And, you know, it's taken me 10 months of something I'm doing, or is it, I just meet, need to meet them where they are, meet them where they are. And if that's where they are, how do I become more mindful and more aware of them? And what, what do they really need? Because they just may not be ready at this moment but they may be ready in six months from now. Maybe it's a year from now. So how do we just kind of continue that relationship, stay top of mind, make sure that we've communicated, you know, what we have to offer and 
when there's enough uh, uh, pain or the right time, then then I, I believe that those those contracts are, are going to come to fruition. Patience and perseverance. That's what it, that's what I found are, are necessary to succeed in this business. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of succeeding in this business, there, there are a lot of newer coaches that like to watch these videos to gain intelligence on how they might succeed uh, sooner, more assuredly. Uh, do you have any advice, Trevor, for new coaches and uh, that are starting out their practices? One of the things that, you know, I'm in my sixth year and something I still do every month with some seasoned coaches is practice coaching. Mm-hmm. And it's just one of those things. I know if you're a newer coach, you're probably going to be already be doing a lot of that. So what we just started doing, there's three of us that we meet at least monthly, just do a, some practice. And what we started doing was taking a real client situation, you know, no names or anything, and just sending that to one of the other coaches. And then you play the role of the client that you're working with, and then they coach you. The amount of ideas that we have gotten through there is unbelievable because when, when you're coaching someone, especially if you're a new coach, mm-hmm. you know, am I taking the right approach? And it's fascinating and so much fun and humbling to work with another professional coach with the actual live problem you're working on in, in a role play. Yeah. Cause I always, you know, when I coach leaders, it's like, Hey, you know, I'm not around grab somebody else that you work with that you respect as a leader and just role play that problem out. Well, if I'm giving that advice, I got to do it myself and it really works. Like it's super powerful. And it's one thing it's, uh, I'm not giving that up because I know it keeps me on top of my game. And I know that I can bring more value to the client because I'll be more expansive thinking going into those sessions. So it's, it's really awesome. I, I love that exercise. Uh, I I've, I've experienced it because as a faculty member of the center for executive coaching, I, I bring role play situations to our, our training webinars and uh, and they're often situations that are drawn from my my real world real coaching experience right uh, but this idea of, of imparting that to other coaches and, and having them go through it it might not come uh, as uh, uh, as readily as the right way to practice coaching to gain twofold one you're you're getting practice coaching but two you're getting another coach's perspective on situations you're working on which is so helpful well, Trevor, it's been a real pleasure talking with you today about uh, your business and the uh, importance of emotional intelligence in manufacturing and talking about just coaching in general. It's an, been a very productive and fruitful conversation. I, I, I knew it would be, but I just really want to thank you for being a guest on the show today. Yeah, thanks for all your help through everything and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to learn a little more from you, Michael. Thanks a lot, Trevor. Great being with yeah. you today. 